Hello and, and welcome everyone to our second of three in our webinar series, Equitable Deployment of Capital. Um, do you mind going to the next slide, Kat? Thank you. So um, as we get started, we have a little um, intro up top and then we'll jump right into our panel conversation. But as we get started, please use the chat function to share your name, where you're joining us from, and one question that you're sitting with today on the topic that brought us all here. Um, so do you mind going to the next slide? <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so like I said, welcome to the second webinar in our Equitable De Deployment of Capital webinar series. Um, today we're talking with the Serdna Foundation and 1863 Ventures on learning together and how um, they have partnered to equitably move capital and learn as they go. So we want to thank our panelists who we will introduce in a few minutes, as well as the Kellogg Foundation for supporting this series um, we will be your facilitators today. My name is Kayla Christofferson. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm an associate at the Center for Evaluation Innovation. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Kat Athanasiades. Her pronouns are she, her, and she's based in Washington, D.C., and Kat is a senior associate with CEI. <clears throat> Thank you. So before we begin, we want to acknowledge that tomorrow is an important day. Juneteenth is the United States Second Independence Day, marking June 19th, 1865, when the remaining enslaved people in Texas were freed by executive decree. Um, our country's legacy of slavery is still deeply entrenched in our country, our systems, and worldviews. And nearly 160 years later, it's the reason we're having this conversation today. We are still grappling with the inequitable systems that slavery created and working toward true liberation, which necessarily includes equitably moving capital to entrepreneurs of color. So we're really keeping this top of mind as we move forward. Thanks. So a little bit about what spurred this webinar series. Um, this webinar is the product of conversations with a set of funders about ways that philanthropy can and does work toward closing the widening racial wealth gap in the United States. So we're asking, how can foundation program learning and evaluation functions be best positioned as partners to close the widening racial wealth gap in the US? And so in this series, we're focusing on this one approach that some foundations use, which is equitably deploying capital to Black, Indigenous, Latin-A, and other entrepreneurs of color. And we're exploring what the work is, how foundations and organizations partner together, and where and how learning and evaluation functions can add value. Um, next slide, thank you. So in today's webinar, we're exploring two central ideas. First, what it looks like to learn together as funders and on the ground partners about moving capital equitably to entrepreneurs of color. And second, how a foundation's learning and evaluation function can support the work of both internal and external partners in this work. And so with that, we are pleased to be joined today by our three panelists, Melissa Bradley, Patrice Green, and Jeff jimenez Curlander. Melissa Bradley is the founder, CEO, and general partner of 1863 Ventures, a platform dedicated to supporting new majority entrepreneurs in generating $100 billion in new wealth by 2030. She is a professor of practice at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University exited founder and board member of Eat the Change and a trustee of the Nathan Cummings Foundation. Melissa is a recipient of a number of accolades and awards, some of which include the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Alliance Excellence Award for Impact, Forbes 50 over 50 list for social entrepreneurship, the Washington Business Journal's Power 100 list, the John Carroll Award, the Entrepreneurship Faculty Excellence Award and the Ideas Worth Teaching Award. So we are very excited to have Melissa with us today. Um, we're also joined by Patrice Green. She is the Vice President of Programs at the Serdna Foundation, where she works closely with Serdna's president and staff on program priorities, 
funding strategies and facilitating collaboration. She oversees the inclusive economies and sustainable environments program teams and collaborates closely with the Thriving Cultures team. Patrice leads CERDNA's democratic participation work to ensure communities of color and low wealth communities have decision-making and political power. She has over 15 years of building innovative cross-sector partnerships that work hand-in-hand -hand with neighborhoods, leveraging their strengths, knowledge, and solutions. Patrice serves as a board co-chair for Bread and Roses Community Fund and a board member for the eBay Foundation, Entrepreneurship Funders Network, and the Way We Are All Educators organization. Welcome, Patrice. And finally, we're joined by Jeff Jimenez Kurlander. Jeff is the Learning and Impact Officer for the Learning and Grant Operations Department at the CERDNA Foundation. He supports the overall planning and implementation of the Foundation's learning agenda by creating systems to capture and assess data, building knowledge to help achieve greater impact for CERDNA's grantee partnerships, and working to make the Foundation desired outcomes a reality. He has spent nearly a decade in the nonprofit and philanthropic sector, and we learned today that it is his sixth anniversary at the CERDNA Foundation today, so a day to celebrate. Um, prior to joining his current team, Jeff spent over a year with CERDNA's Inclusive Economies team as a program associate, where he streamlined the grant-making process, supported the creation of indicators and metrics, and represented the team across the country. Before joining the CERDNA Foundation, Jeff worked with the Rockefeller Foundation's U.S. Jobs and Economic Opportunity Team. So welcome, Jeff, and welcome to all our panelists. Thank you all for for being here today and really excited to for this conversation. Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to Kat to lead us forward. Thank you so much for introducing everybody and for introducing this uh, series, Kayla. Um, and echoing Kayla, welcome, Melissa, Patrice, and Jeff. We're just so pleased to have you all on this webinar today. Um, so we wanted to start out with a question for, we also, so a few things. Uh, one is that as folks are listening, <clears throat> excuse me, as you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Um, and if there are things that are relevant, you know, for the, for what we're talking about at that moment, um, we'll work to integrate them into the conversation. And if there are things that we want to hold for the Q&A part at the end, then we will hold them. Um, so we anticipate that this part of the conversation will be about 35 minutes and then um, uh, we'll have Q&A for 15 minutes and that can change based on if we're you know, answering questions throughout. We also want this to feel conversational. So if, if it feels like it's going in a lot of different ways, that's because it probably is. And these are all the ways that we need to move today. So um, we're just, yeah, so <laughs> excited to see where this conversation takes us. Um, and I think that that's all the housekeeping stuff that I wanted to say, yep, before we jump in. So um, our first question, just to kick us off, is uh, really for Melissa and Patrice. Um, well, starting with Melissa, what was the need that you saw that uh, compelled you to create 1863 Ventures? And also, if you can share um, more about what what is 1863 Ventures? Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me in uh, quite a poignant moment because the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863, uh, but it took two years to, to get to folks, particularly in Galveston, Texas. Um, 1863 was started uh, as a community-based project in Washington, D.C., with the idea to support entrepreneurship in historically marginalized communities. If anybody knows the nation's capital, there are where the monuments are, and then there's the rest of the city, uh, particularly wards uh, six, seven, and eight. And so we did a, a community service project to kind of really focus on entrepreneurs with this idea that there were entrepreneurs there that were being overlooked while all of the significant academic institutions in the area were really focused on entrepreneurship and kind of bringing people in and pushing them back to their own communities. And that quickly evolved to being just a service project, to being a fiscally sponsored organization, to now being a national uh, nonprofit organization with a family of uh, for-profit investment funds, uh, thanks to the folks at CERN and many others. So, so deeply grateful for that. And I think the the reason we've been able to expand, because I will say I'm not a person that believes you just stand up stuff for the heck of it, was because as we have grown, uh, starting in 2016, officially, that the number of folks of color, particularly Black women who are focused on entrepreneurship has risen. And while anybody can start a business, there is a unique nuance of who can grow a business and, and who has the capacity 
to help you do that. And so I think the gap that we were filling was an authentic one of who were people who had actually started businesses, uh, who had exited those businesses, who actually had the expertise that could share their wisdom, and more importantly, who had the cultural competency to be able to provide that for uh, founders of color. And so we are now with over 10,000 folks in our database. We've graduated over 4,000 people. We've created over 3,000 jobs. Uh, and our sole focus is to really foster responsible entrepreneurship through rigorous training, uh, access to capital, and cultural competency in the work that we do. All right. Thanks so much, Melissa. And Patrice, so what uh, what is the reason why Cerna wanted to fund this work that Melissa is working on? I mean, to start, well, so one, thank you, Kat. Thank you, Kayla. Um, thank you, Melissa, for being here. And, you know, we're always excited that we, we've got Jeff for, for a whole six years. Um, so a couple things I'll say. I mean, first, you all heard Melissa's bio. Um, so there's a little of like, how how can we not? Um, but to sort of give a little bit of, you know, how we started out this journey, you know, Melissa has been uh, a partner. My, my predecessor, Shauna Scoffrey, had sort of brought Melissa in to help be a part of a, originally a kitchen cabinet um, before we even had our inclusive economies um, strategy. Um, and having this conversation about, you know, what does entrepreneurship look like? How are we shifting? Um, and thinking about, you um, not just economic development, but really thinking about entrepreneurship as that tool to close the racial wealth gap. Um, and we were early in the space of thinking about and recognizing um, all the things that I think Melissa just noted in terms of um, the rise of uh, communities of color, particularly um, as we've seen over the last few years, black women being um, the highest growing number of folks, you know, starting businesses and going into entrepreneurship and really starting to think about what does it mean to support that growth and development? And um, not just in the smallest of businesses, but in all of the places where we can, um, you know, create high growth opportunities for our communities and create some access opportunities. Um, and so we actually started out um, working with Melissa on a research project. Um, and I think one of the things about how and why it was important to be um, flexible, um, you know, if we talk about trust-based philanthropy, to really be centering folks who are not only most impacted, but have the knowledge. You heard all of the things that Melissa's done. She's an excellent entrepreneur. She's been um, investing in folks. Um, she is a scholar and teacher of um, entrepreneurship. And so, you know, really having someone who was close, who could really be thinking about what does it mean and what do we need um, for entrepreneurs of color and that folks were gonna come and learn from both her experiences, um, but the network that that she has built. Um, and so getting in partnership and doing this research um, project and sort of learning, you know, what folks were willing to say and what they weren't. <laughs> um, and thinking about the pivots that were necessary. And so, you know, that early work um, that Melissa talks about um, under the, the Project 500 and thinking about what was um, necessary based on what they were seeing coming out um, and of all places of our nation's capital. Um, and so then our ability to get in and support Melissa to be thinking about like, okay, it's not just connection, like folks need this really full scale support about like how they move um, and connect the dots around their business. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, initially it was a series of programs, you know, an accelerator program. How do we, um, how do we make sure that folks are getting the knowledge and the connection? Um, and part of what they learned in that was, you know, capital is still key and, you know, the number of businesses, um, that, ha that came through, um, and I will never forget, it is sort of burned into my mind. Um, we were in DC. It was a beautiful spring day. <laughs> I was there um, with our director at the time, Michaela Davis, and our director of impact investing, Shweb Siddiqui, for the first 1863 cohort um, accelerator program. And we're sitting and we're listening to these businesses talk. And Schweb turns and looks at me. He was like, I don't understand. What do you mean that these businesses have been in business for, you know, some people up to 20 years with million plus revenue and they can't get a loan. 
they can't get access to capital. And so not only were we able to sort of partner, um, I think just in the granting, but it allowed us to sort of open up the mind um, and start a conversation on our impact investing side about like, there is something missing here and we have a partner who is primed and ready to do something about it. Thanks, Patrice. Yeah, and I love that example also because when I think about like how foundations sometimes all the time talk about like working in silos, you're talking about bringing in other folks into the room with a partner like Melissa, like 1863 Ventures, and then that creating these different changes that are going to like support the work to move even further um, that, that the certain foundation is able to support. Um, so, so, okay. So we heard a bit about the partnership from your side, but Melissa, is there anything that you would add about what this partnership has looked like for you? And then also like what it's enabled and if there's any tensions or sticking points that, <laughs> that you've experienced that you've been able to move through? You know, um, well, first I, I think I, I want to, um, and thank Patrice for that excellent recap, because every time I hear that story, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. There was something new. I think there's a, a few things that I would pull out um, before I talk about how the relationship has evolved. I think the first thing is they were approachable. Um, I will never forget coming off a stage in Kansas City, I think it was of all places, for a Kaufman event and literally just grabbing a couch uh, outside of the auditorium with Sean and Patrice and Sean was like, okay, so what, what you up to? And like just having this very fluid conversation, no proposal, no application process, just, hey, appreciate what you had to say. There was a lot of data there. What are you thinking? What are you seeing? And, and interesting enough, that conversation with the three of us ultimately then turning into about 20 people sitting around and, and just sharing their insight. And, and I have to say with no disrespect to other funders, but they don't usually give you that amount of time. I think we sat there for a good hour plus um, and, and there was no gatekeeping. It was like everybody got a chance to speak. And I think that's unique, right? The first takeaway is the willingness to understand that learning can happen anywhere. And that time is a commodity to be used for research, not just to make decisions. And so the exploration that was allowed and being able to say like, we don't have all the answers, but here's what we're thinking. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is, is teasing out, the research was designed to talk about the performance returns of black founders. What we found is that both the venture capitalists nor the uh, founders wanted to share that information uh, because it was not stellar. And so we had to pivot the research uh, and I had to go back and say, so what we mapped out what was going to happen, what it really happened was this. Uh, and and they're willing to say, okay, well, what is the data that you found and how can that be valuable? And so that actually began this process of understanding that it costs at least a quarter of a million dollars more to support a black founder or a brown founder than their white peer and all of the reasons why. And so I think that's the second thing that uh, I have heard from other people that, you know, if the project goes awry, you can forget it. You're never going to get more money and, you know, they're, they're kind of going to write you off. And I think that really just signifies a learning journey. And I think the, the other piece, too, that I would say the third thing is the diverse use of capital. Um, and so it was a, I'd say, probably a, a project support for the research. Uh, then once we got up and running, it was a money to support the program. And then in that conversation with Schweb, it was a grant that we were going to be allowed to act as an investment to test the hypothesis of what would it mean to provide access to capital to Black and Brown founders. And more importantly, what was the infrastructure required for them to be successful? Uh, and that was great, right? Because I think they were looking at it as not like, okay, there's some little money, go see what you can get. But really we're saying, okay, so what did you learn? Uh, while it was a grant, what did you learn about that? And that then teed up the ability for us to have the infrastructure to now have this family of funds, of which again, certain it was, was our first investment in and, and we're very grateful. So I think the willingness to look at a partner uh, and say, what are the diverse sources of capital I have? Not, well, this partner is going to do this piece of work and this partner is going to do this piece of work, but how do we use all of the capital that we have and allocate it appropriately with, with varied capital stacks to actually achieve this kind of shared vision and mission? And so I think those things are, are pretty unique. I, I think where we are now is that the conversation still continues. Uh, we continue to have conversations around what we have learned around investing in uh, Black and Brown founders, particularly post-George Floyd and now with this kind of backlash of, of legal and, and other issues that are that are plaguing us in terms of what is their risk tolerance? Uh, what is it that, how can we be helpful in sharing what's happening, not just to us as the intermediaries, but what's happening to the founders? 
Um, I think they've obviously gone on to be a great partner in terms of being able to support our work uh, financially, but also to be an advocate of our work to other people. Uh, you know, it's almost like when you apply to college and you have to get a recommendation, I'm like, call the Sardin Foundation because they'll tell you sometimes we did really great stuff and sometimes we missed the mark completely. And I would say what I, what I look forward to is their, is their ingenuity. Um, I have no problem saying that as, as the foundation's ethos and, and investment statements have evolved, they have changed. And this willingness to say, hey, we, we were here, you were here, we were lockstep. We may be going in a slightly different direction. How do you come along with us? And, and I think that's huge um, as we have the old rhetoric, like leave no one behind. But this idea is their own internal investment thesis changes with board members and what's happening in the universe and what does it mean to have financial returns? Still saying, hey, how can we still help you on this journey? Because we understand the significance of your work. Uh, so I think it's it's been a great relationship. And, and I think there's been no sticking points because I think it's truly started from a place of just trust. Uh, you know, they trusted my candor when we first met and I trusted their candor of saying what they can and cannot do. And so I think it's easy to call up and say, this is not working. Um, I would also say the trust has expanded beyond just what I do. Uh, I think, you know, CERNA is a huge ecosystem builder. And because of the work that Patrice and Michaelia did back in the day of kind of convening the grantees, I think there's an entire ecosystem and sounding board that they opened up an opportunity for me to talk to other people. I, I remember having this idea that we should be involved in policy. And then I went to this summit, I talked to policy, so we should not be involved in policy. No, no, no. Uh, and, and not because it wasn't important, but like what a, a plethora of people that were already doing that. Where we needed to be advocates was amongst financial institutions because we had that credibility as fellow investors. And so we were able in that moment, I think we were in Austin, to say, hey, we didn't know about you. Great work. Let's share that data. We're going to focus on financial institutions and together and collectively, let's move the needle in terms of how capital is dispersed to, to founders of color. So no, no sticking points, I think, just continued iteration, uh, brainstorming, uh, and I would say continued expanded risk tolerance as obviously what's happening in the world continues to change. Great, thanks, Melissa. Um, so a uh, follow-up for Patrice and Jeff. I know, Melissa, the way that you're talking about this partnership, a lot of it is, is well, a lot of it is based both in like the, um, your backgrounds and your ex experience and expertise and the perspectives that you bring. And then there's also this connecting as people that happened and that allowed you to, you know, enter into this trusting relationship together. Um, we were, uh, we're thinking about on the certain side. So this is for yeah, Patrice and Jeff. Are there internal mechanisms or systems or culture things about that are particular to Serdna that you think make this approachability and this ability to kind of give some breathing room for relationships that make that possible? You know, that's an interesting question, Kat. I mean, I think. Um generally our size is probably something that that lends to that um it's always funny because folks are like how big and we're like yeah we have 28 people and most of our program teams are are you know at one time we're, we're three people and now are two um and if we think about sort of the conversation that we um just had about you know programs in conversation with impact investing um you know and many foundations you know there there's a very um thick wall um, and never the two shall shall meet um, and you sort of keep to your corners of sorts. Um, but I think with just the nature of our size um, and the fact that, you know, nobody is more than, you know, 20, 30 feet from you, um, that enabled us to be in conversation. And then um, there's a, a collaborative spirit. And, you know, when, when Don Chen came to CERNA, that was, that's been really one of his um, big pushes and interests for us to think cross collaboratively, you know, connect um, in these particular ways. And I think we've picked that up and sort of run with it. And so um, in uh, Schweb Siddiqui's tenure, like we just, we made a commitment to be like, take me into your space and I'm going to take you into mine. Um, and so we did that pretty regularly. And even with his departure um, and the arrival of Adam Conacher, who came over from Rockefeller, like we've continued uh, that practice of how do we sort of get into the same room so that we can hear the same things. And then 
we can do the work internally to sort of kick it around and figure out, um, you know, where there may be those sticking points that I'm really glad that Melissa's like, she doesn't necessarily feel, um, but how we are able to work through whatever those issues are um, for us. And then to be able to come back, you know, to our partners like Melissa to say, so here's here's where it is from the investment side. Here's where it is from the program side. Um, tell us what, this. these are the things that we are thinking. Tell us what you need. Um, or to, be, to say, you know, this is what we're hearing in different places. Um, does that, does that, is it, can you, does that validate where, where you are or what's off? And for, um, in some cases for us to be the ones to go in the room and push and ask some different questions of folks, um, frankly. Um, and so I think that has been key. And even as we've had um, staff changes and reorg, that that spirit has continued to um, hold. And I think as long as we do that, and, you know, as we think about our commitments to trust-based philanthropy, I think that is sort of the crux of what we take and hold um, and really help to try to instill across our staff as folks come in, um, that in order for us to do our work well, like we've actually got to build really trusted relationships that folks are going to tell us, you know, when things aren't working, um, because, <clears throat> The world is changing in such a rapid way. It's not all going to be sunshine and roses. And the real work is when, you know, something isn't working. And I think that's also when the real learning is. Um, mm -hmm. And as we think about this from a, if we think about it from an entre entrepreneurial perspective, and particularly from a venture capital perspective, like the real, the reality is we're trying to create the space so that entrepreneurs of color have the, ha can fail the way, frankly, white entrepreneurs get to all the time. And so our ability to have folks fail forward, fail fast, learn, and that we stick with them and we see this as a long-term journey because we are looking to make structural and generational changes, um, I think are the things that, you know, we we sort of lean into. So I'm going to just riff off of, off of Patrice a, a bit there. Um, so th the way I'll answer uh, these questions will be from the perspective of where I sit in in the institution. So I have more of a bird's eye view of of, of what our grant making teams are are doing. Uh, so first, to just give con uh, just context to the characteristics of our grant making, uh, which says a lot about how our grant makers as certain uh, practice philanthropy, right? Um, so we just wrapped up a very busy year in grant making for us where we made 212 grants. And these data points are fresh in my mind because Patrice and I have been pouring over them over the last two days. Uh, our average grant size was about $275,000. 62% of our grants were multi-year support. 80% of our grant dollars distributed were unrestricted. And when we consider who leads uh, these organizations, 66% of our grantees in our portfolio are BIPOC-led. So when we think about partnership in the context of philanthropy, it's important that we get the basics right, like how we set our grants up and who we decide to support. And this is one way uh, trust-based philanthropy shows up in our work. I think at the end of the day, uh, as you heard Patrice uh, say, we believe that trust um, is is key, and 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 it's not about letting go of control. I think it's about it's about getting results, and and so I think trusting in our grantees' knowledge and leadership uh, is incredibly is, is incredibly efficient, and it lends itself to getting us um, closer to the world that we envision. So. What do I mean uh, when I when I say trust is not about letting go of control? Uh, for us, we view trust-based philanthropy as the kind of deliberate shift from the age-old paradigm of funders having most of the power in the funder-grantee relationship and moving towards a partnership model where power is shared, right? The, and the way that has shown up at CERDNA is by is inviting our grantee partners to the table when designing strategies. Uh, rather than uh, telling grantees what to measure, uh, uh, we work together with our partners to identify metrics uh, and indicators that they would report on. Even in building the learning systems, the very technical pieces of, of, of capturing learning about our metrics, we engaged our grantees and solicited their feedback. 
And rather than keeping that data to ourselves, uh, locked away for our benefit and for our own learning, uh, we return that information to our grantees for their learning. Uh, so, you know, I think um, I think that is some additional kind of behind the scenes work uh, that really, I think, enables strong partnerships like the one we have uh, with Melissa in 1863. And I think all these touch points with our grantees ultimately kind of enables more trust, more collaboration and, and more community. Yeah, thanks for jumping in, Jeff. Patrice, it looks like you're about to come off mute and say something. Am I right? Nope. Okay. Um, well, let me ask a follow up, Jeff, just to add a little bit more uh, uh, color to what the uh, work is at CERDNA, to what the learning work is at CERDNA. There's a question that came in that we wanted to pose now um, in the Q and A, and it's what what does the broader learning infrastructure look like at CERDNA? Uh, and what are the kinds of cross grantee learning mechanisms that exist to take that holistic and cross sector learning approach? So I'll say, and I'll, and I'll, I'll invite Patrice to, to uh, add more color to this too, but I, I would say that our learning approach at CERDNA is, uh, we, we take a kind of federated approach where learning is the job of all of our programs, right? Where, where the LGL team support uh, uh, their efforts. So uh, what does that mean for, for me? Uh, we, uh, my job at CERNA is, you know, supporting their learning and evaluation work by doing things like reviewing reports, summarizing findings and, sur and, and surfacing themes. Uh, but the, 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 the points at which uh, our grantees and our program teams uh, cross are through various different mechanisms. I, you know, I, I, I mentioned before uh, inviting our grantees to provide feedback on things like um, our learning systems. Uh, that, that was done through a pilot uh, of sorts. Um, our program teams host uh, regularly um, or quarterly town halls uh, where they get to engage on learning and other topics. Uh, and um, at, at, when when we launched our our, our 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 new strategies and our evaluative frameworks, uh, we actually convened our grantees uh, in Austin um, to 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 uh, wrestle with the data and 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 to and to discuss how we might learn from it, how we might uh, build networks uh, uh, together. Okay, thank you for going into that a little bit more. Um, and I was wondering if you could all share then thinking about, uh, so Jeff, the way you're describing um, the learning work and, and some of, now some of these like cross um, cross sector learning uh, opportunities that, that you all are hosting. Uh, Melissa, you were talking about um, learning about the work and for example, like what is the actual cost to support to, to start up and stay up uh, um, a black or brown woman led business. Um, and Patrice, you're talking about learning about ourselves at the CERNA Foundation, what's not working and how do we create the space to learn and to fail for our grantees. Um, just in, in these different things that you're learning about and that you're also you know sharing with the field, um, because that I think has been a big part of uh, at least how I've experienced the learning work through the CERNA Foundation. Um, what are some of the ways you started talking about it a little bit before, but that you're using that learning to make decisions? And do you whether do you have some concrete examples you might share um, about how the learning work that you're doing is leading to decision making for your in each of your roles? Yeah, happy to um, jump in a little on that. Maybe I'll draw a little from uh, where sort of Jeff left off. Um, so you know, there's a bit of like the formal process um, to, that Jeff noted in terms of um, particularly for the inclusive economies um, team where, you know, we went through this process to uh, in collaboration with the grantees to identify, you know, what metrics would look like and to create space for grantees to then select from a menu um, that they have already sort of vetted to a certain extent that says like, this is what's most impactful to their work. Um, and then part of what we're, you know, in the process of of doing, and that Jeff is really um, key to the team in helping, is 
how do we aggregate what we are seeing across the portfolio and then be able to share that back to grantees? Um, and part of that is to be able to think about where there are places that we're seeing um, bright spots, where there are places that we may be seeing holes, um, and where might there be opportunities for um, uh, for us to like either think about whether that's specific to the strategy or for us as a foundation to think about um, the support work that we needed. Um, what's really interesting, so we are in the midst of a, a five-year review of the strategy. And so looking at all the data that we've had over the past um, five years, and we haven't sort of published all the things, but one of the things, and it's an interesting sort of note, because I know Melissa will remember, she was one of those folks who was who were in our conversations around it. And we went through this process, particularly around metrics, because folks were like, there isn't really great data. And that's why we've continued to support the work of folks like uh, Melissa and 1863 Ventures that also have that really robust sort of research component to their work to really be able to drill down and identify what's particularly, what is specific and different for the experience of um, entrepreneurs of color or new majority entrepreneurs, as, as Melissa would say. Um, and she's got some great research, you know, the Beyond the Five research that I can let Melissa sort of talk about. You know, there are th some things that we think about in terms of entrepreneurs and small business um, that we sort of paint this broad brush that isn't quite as accurate um, for entrepreneurs of color. Um, and so therefore then we're not tailoring programs, uh, explicitly. And so I think one of the things that we are finding is that five years later with all of the things that have happened in the world and for all of our efforts, um, we actually have less data, um, at a national level. Um, and so the need to continue to sort of lean in and to think about, um, one, how do we, create more space for folks like Melissa, um, who are now have, uh, you know, a national platform of um, entrepreneurs that they're serving to be able to elevate that data, um, to be able to think about where are ways for us as a foundation body to think about like, how are we, how do we use what we've already been gathering to in the, in the, in the interim, try and fill the holes um, and, uh, create uh, opportunities to leverage what our partners are doing and to um, close those gaps and, and uplift those stories. So I think that's one of the ways. Um, I think one of the other ways that um, we did, and this is a little body of work that is continues to happen, is in listening to our grantee partners, we actually did um, a small learning cohort that included um, some participatory grant making. And that was based on what we heard. Um, so Melissa talked about that convening in Austin um, and everybody's like, get us all together so we can have these experiences and talk cross um, portfolio um, so that the folks who are directly working with entrepreneurs can talk to the folks who are on the policy side or on the organizing side. And how do we connect um, some of those spaces. And so we um, took 12 of our grantees who have worked together over about a year and a half um, to identify um, a series of projects that they're gonna like see forward and that they decided on where the dollars have gone. And so that was again, in response to what we've heard from our grantees, both in our conversations, but um, through what we're learning from them and where, they, where they're noting like this could be space and opportunity that the foundation has a unique place to create an opportunity that is, is financially supported for folks to be able to come together and think um, about what could be possible. Oops, I just wanna add if I, if I may, unless Jeff, you wanna go ahead. Um, there were a few things in there that I, that I think um, Patrice hit, but I want to put an exclamation point on understanding who the audience might be. I think the 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 three competitive advantages that I see in our partnership with certain, but also with all their other grantees, because we do know each other, uh, is that one, they do not look at this as a competitive process. This is not a crabs in the barrel. Um, this is, we are trying to solve something, come with your best ideas, um, we're not going to have a, a competition between groups, but think about how do you all work together? And that's a, that's a big shift 
in the social sector. I came from the for-profit sector and I was like, oh my God, why would anybody want to be in the nonprofit sector? Because you're so busy fighting the people for grants that you can't even focus on the problem. Um, I think the second thing is that we have very honest conversations with everybody at certain uh, we're not trying to make the problem better. We're actually trying to solve the problem. And I think that there is that that gives us a larger risk aperture in terms of what we can and cannot do. Um, and, and what they're willing to listen to and support and or advocate for. I don't, I'm not in this business because I just want to keep training entrepreneurs. I'm in this business because I want to make sure that we're able to demonstrate that entrepreneurship is truly the path to wealth creation. And how do we then leave behind an infrastructure that allows that to happen with less friction than currently does? That doesn't mean that my institution needs to continue. Uh, and so I love the, 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 the risk tolerance, but I would also say the aggressive nature by which we recognize as the world around us changes, that there is a sense of urgency about what we're doing. Um, and then the final thing is that they allow us to learn. I, to to Patricia's point, I had never known anybody who was running a nonprofit organization to be able to get money for research if they were not a think tank. Um, and the fact that they were even willing to entertain, like they didn't say why, they were like, how is it going to be helpful and how can we help? Um, and I think to to Patrice's point, you know, I don't expect agencies to be around forever, right? I feel like we will come up with an, a mass with a massive amount of data points that then becomes a training ground for others who want to do this work. Because I will never get to the end goal of everybody solving this problem if other people don't do so. And so I think that this issue of data declining is very scary because we now then have politicians and policymakers making decisions based on anecdotes and not real facts. And that is extremely dangerous. And so I think one of the things that that, that the Certain Foundation was able to support is our Beyond Five survey, because the narrative was Black businesses are not successful businesses. Therefore, don't invest in them. Uh, when the whole PP thing happened, well, you know, they, they, they just they just only, you know, want grants and, and those kinds of things. And, and that's a dangerous narrative. And what we found for Beyond Five is that we anecdotally saw lots of founders who were existing well beyond the five years. And so the data proved us out that while 50 to 60 percent of all businesses fail within three to five years, black and brown founders are lasting a minimum of 8.5 years, which is fascinating because during COVID, like, oh, they're out of business. I'm like, no, it's all about when you count it, right? If you caught the guy who's trying to open up a gym on the day he was driving an Uber, then you would say he's not a founder. And that has been very helpful, not just for certain, but for lots of other people when they think about how do you examine cash flow of black and brown founders. We also found that while they last the longest, their longevity does not correlate to access to capital or revenue. So in many cases, they're subsidizing their own businesses in the hope and, and maturation of the American dream, which says what an amazing opportunity to think about the, the, the line of capital right, the continuum of capital that can be inserted at different points that becomes not just supportive, but catalytic, because we now know their resilience can be extended even more. And then finally, we know that black and brown businesses hire more black and brown people. And so I think those are three things that have nothing to do with how I run my organization, but very much have to do with how do we really shore up this larger economic system called capitalism that allows for equity and equality of the fastest growing segment of founders. It's not race-based. It's not gender-based. It's just factually based on what we're learning in pursuit of an equitable economy. And I think that that's huge because we asked other people for money for research and they were like, that's not what you do. You guys run programs and no disrespect, but we're not going to solve America's social ills because I'm running a program or a project. You have to have the ability to do it all. And I really am in deep gratitude to CERNA for allowing us as an organization to experiment and figure out who do we need to be to be successful. And that turned out to be a nonprofit organization to give free services. That turned out to be a research shop where we could focus on narrative change. And that turned out to be capital providers thinking about what are the various fund strategies we can deploy. And a lot of other people have just tried to keep us in in a box and say, you should just keep running those programs. And those are not the people that I want to be in partnership with because our mission is actually to create wealth and solve this problem. And, and I do think having been in philanthropy and a, and a former CEO of a foundation and now on the board, that's where these conversations have to shift, that, that we are at a point in time politically, legally, that we have to make big leaps and no longer small steps and recognize with those big leaps, we may make some failures, but what is it that we learn so that we don't repeat those mistakes? Right now, history is repeating itself and it's not looking good for people like me.
Thanks, Melissa. Jeff, were you going to jump in before with something or are you going to? No, I'm not going to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Official proverbial mic drop. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we will, um, we'd love to see if there's any um, folks who have questions to please drop those into the Q&A box that is somewhere on your Zoom screen. Um, and while folks are thinking about those, but also listening and typing into the box, um, Jeff and Patrice, I just wanted to make sure that we shared uh, anything else that you wanted to say about the question about I know we've we've talked a bit about how um, learning and impact and program are you know about how you're working at CERDNA kind of generally, but really specifically like how you're partnering internally, um, internally to advance the work, and then like what is the again I know we we talked about it a little bit, but any other like mechanisms that you have in place to partner externally, like what is the what is the learning and impact and program relationship at CERDNA? Yeah, I'm happy to start. And then Jeff, please um, jump in. I mean, you know, it really is, you know, we talked about this sort of partnership and we really have sort of walked alongside each other to um, one, to build out the metrics. And so it sort of looks like, you know, programs sub serving as a subject matter expert on, um, you know, the relationship with the grantees and, you know, what type of data we think we may be looking for. And, um, you know, Jeff and our learning team really serving as experts and helping us to think through, um, you know, what is our system of flux capable of, capable of doing and how do we shift that? Um, <clears throat> you know, we went through this process of working with the grantees on the data to figure out like, okay, here's here are all the things that we heard that you all were, are collecting um what sound what are and then narrowing that down to a series of things and then we ran a literal pilot and um melissa and 1863 ventures participated in so that folks could test out what does it look like to select your metrics up front and then report on them in the system and sort of see them um and you know, it, it's interesting when I first got to CERDNA and like, we've always had a reporting mechanism. We, we make every effort for it not to be burdensome. Um, but one of the observations, you know, and change happens across institutions is that, you know, whoever the development officer was that like wrote the, wrote the um, application may or may not be the development officer or the person who needs to um, do the reporting. Um, and originally there was no carryover in our system, like literally from the application to um, the report. And so well, that was one of the things that we talked with the LGO team about, how do we bring forward so that um, grantees are really clear and it's easy so that you see upfront what it is you said to start with, and then you can sort of reflect back um, on that. And, you know, Jeff can talk about the specifics. I mean, even now we're in a place of like, oh, so what happens when you know, something changes. We have um, <clears throat> we have an ethos of like, to Melissa's point, like, you know, we might've selected this thing in terms of metrics and now, you know, we had to pivot. We're in a place where we're having to figure out how do we, how do we allow for those pivots in what we've created in the tool and how we sort of collect our metrics. And so that looks like us sitting down and sort of like kicking back and forth on how do we create a little like, policy note. What does that mean for the grantee? How do we roll that out to folks to make sure that folks know? Um, and, you know, what's most useful to be collecting when that happens? Um, and then, uh, you know, Jeff can sort of talk about how, you know, thinking through the aggregation of that, and that's one of the places that we're at. Um, and then our ability to share that back out um, with uh, our grantee partners. We haven't yet got to the place, particularly around the metrics where we're sharing sort of those big data points, but we've definitely shared out the process um, and we'll continue to do that. But, you know, Jeff, love to hear you sort of talk about from your perspective about how we've been, I think, walking lockstep um, <laughs> for the most part on this. Yeah, for sure. I, I'll, I'll start um, a, a bit broad and then I'll, I'll, I'll narrow in um, and, and get a little wonky. So I apologize. Um, but I think internally, 
um, the 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 way we we partner with 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 our program teams, which you know Patrice heads up now, is is I think we we first I think we lean into our values in in a in an authentic way. One of the great things about our team in in uh, and and the the learning and grant operations team is that the evaluation, uh, grants management, and technology functions are vertically integrated, which allows us to test ideas quickly with an eye towards learning. And uh, and we we have the the technical know how to stand the thing up and 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 just go with it. So. So we're both kind of programmatic and technical. So we have devised different tools to help uh, our program officers respond to the needs of our grantee partners really quickly. These tools help free up grant dollars. Uh, our application process is extremely streamlined uh, uh, with many of our grant partners not having to submit any materials at all. Uh, so we try to remove uh, any and all barrier barriers that prevent us um, from getting precious resources to, to our grantees while still prioritizing learning, right? Uh, so we also empower our program teams with very nuanced data points. Uh, we rely on publicly available data uh, resources from 990s, Candid, as well as information our grantees provide us. And then we package these data and share it internally to help our program teams uh, you know, plan their grant making activities, but we also use it as a tool for transparency and accountability for our board and to the broader uh, public. Now, um, what you heard Patrice talk about is our grants management system. How do, how do we how do we configure this uh, seemingly like uh, big system that it seems to only uh, uh, its only purpose might be to uh, get a grant from you know from draft to to pay, but you can get really creative uh, to be able to capture key learning points um, that can then be used uh, in in very kind of um, flexible ways uh, and scalable ways that allows someone like me to to aggregate information really quickly that for for the for the quantitative data. But then we also prioritize qualitative data, and that takes time to 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 read through and to surface themes. But we also do that because that's part of that that we we prioritize that information, and in fact, that's where we find most most of the, the valuable information. Uh, but uh, I I would say configuring the technical side uh, to benefit kind of the programmatic learning aspect has been, uh, one of the things that has been very helpful for, for the learning function here at CERDA. And if I could just throw just one, as Jeff Sutter talked about, I, I think one of the things we're pretty intentional about using the language of learning versus evaluation. Um, and, and I, I want to sort of like, um, put a fine point because Jeff talked about even from the perspective of, you know, the financial due diligence and all of that, um, we don't see those, we don't use those tools as gatekeeping. Um, we really do use them as learning. And part of what that means is also how we've been able to develop um, additional capacity building opportunities for our grantees. Um, because I think to Melissa's point is that we're looking for that longer solve. We're looking to get to the place where, in this case, that we see an economy that is truly inclusive and that we can get folks to this place. And so part of what that means is what's the kind of support that organizations like Melissa's need and what information do we have about how we structure our grants or what other kinds of resources um, we could be able to provide. So really thinking about every aspect of that information as points of learning for um, our program staff and for us to be really thinking about um, where might there be some other places for us to lean in to make folks um, be stronger in their everyday work to, to, you know, to support the communities that they're working with. So I, I I see a question um, that I I, I want to jump on. Uh, uh, so the the question is what what data collection and impact measurement tools Serdna provides uh, to grantees that may not have data infrastructure in place to measure report on metrics that they uh, that they described they collect. 
so this this is a really I think good question, and I, I'm I'm very curious to hear uh, what what you have to say, Patrice. But I think from from my perspective, um, th this is for something that has uh, has bubbled up um, as a theme as we reviewed um, five years worth of of information uh, and reporting. Um, uh, evaluation and data infrastructure is 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 something that is is needed in in the nonprofit sector um, is, and and in our portfolio. Um, one of the things that well, we do uh, in in within the LGO side, um, and and with our um, colleague within the capacity and infrastructure team is we have an organ uh, a program called the Resilient Organizations Initiative, which is a pure capacity building kind of um, uh, program that has kind of different focus areas. We do financial capacity building, we do fundraising capacity building, um, and one of the things that we're trying to we're, that we are considering uh, standing up because of what we've learned from from reporting is what about this kind of this data piece and this learning piece? How can we support this uh, function, uh, especially? Um, uh, given uh, the fact that so many of our uh, uh, grantee partners have uh, are you know are small organizations um, that have been asked to to report on a lot of information but don't necessarily have the means to do it, um, what role can can foundations play? And that and we we see uh, we can play a meaningful role um, there. Um, so that that's my response to that. <clears throat> yeah, I think the only other thing that I would add is that. Um, you know, part of what we learned in, in doing this five-year review and we're still sort of combing through all the things is that folks' participation in our like metrics work and sort of hearing from and connecting with other um, grantee partners across the portfolio has actually helped to build the muscle for folks. Um, and I think one of the ways, though we haven't necessarily like, oh, we have a, this is a data tool that we sort of like, pick out to everyone. Um, we really try to be as, you know, how do we craft the thing that folks need in the moment um, and create the space for that. But the grantees are selecting from uh, a, a menu of metrics. And so we lean into having conversations with folks about like, what are you already capturing? What, what makes sense for you to capture? But I think what folks are able to do is one, be able to build a muscle because there's like, okay, here's what we do and we can tell you this information. And then when they come to participate in a, a town hall for the portfolio and they're hearing about, you know, what other folks are doing or us uplifting or sharing out, they then are able to, and we've made connections across um, the portfolio where they may get support from other grantees who have a stronger um, data background, um, and in some cases, because the, our funds are general operating, like if folks come and have a conversation about like, this is one of the things that they want to build out to be having conversations about their ability to use our funds in that way, or to even thinking about um, where we may have the space to um, increase or support folks to build out or to access tools around their um, data, data gathering or management. I know we're at time. We got to say one last thing, Kat. Um, uh, so w w within my team, we we have a a small portfolio that is focused on data infrastructure and emerging technology. Um, you know, we 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 we're trying to support organizations that are seeking to plug. You know, just glaring data gaps um, within the racial equity kind of um, social impact ecosystem. And and we're also exploring how emerging technologies can help um, accelerate some of these organizations' capacity to do some of these things. So, um, you know, while we're while we're we're, we're we are cautiously exploring how artificial intel intelligence um, can um, is is going to impact kind of civil society um, and 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 different aspects of philanthropy and and um, and and. And seeing how we can support different organizations to to begin to 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 learn about that. Yep. Yeah. I, I just I just want to point out for those who are on foundations, I think that the two things that as a grantee, I would say to anybody else who is in the grant making business, that one, CERN has truly democratized access to philanthropy. 
right? That by by allowing us to walk with them in some of these big decision making, by bringing us together, by actually listening to us, by allowing us to share our stories through our methodology as opposed to a bunch of check boxes and and narrow fill in fields. I think that's extremely important. That I truly hope in light of what we're up against that, that other foundations can do. Um, and then I think the second thing is, is that they're willing to go with the times. Um, and that there, there is a culture that that even though some of the people that Patrice have mentioned have left, um, I've watched them go to other foundations and bring this culture with them. And then when new people have come in, they understand that the culture is one of learning for program officers and program managers, et cetera. And they have truly knocked down on this kind of ivory tower mentality where I have the money and you do the work and here we are back in like serfdom times without with a bunch of platitudes but not really understanding how to create progress and so I think the culture that has been created certainly with Patrice and Jeff at the helm of what they're doing is huge because it's rippling when folks leave but it also is just slaps you in the face as soon as you walk in to say this is not we're not operating on a power dynamic we are operating on a partnership and trust that you two want to solve similar problems and we can do this together. And I can honestly say, I don't necessarily get that with anybody else that's given us money. Well, thank you all so much. I know we're at time, we're over time, um, but uh, I love the, um, the passion and the enthusiasm and um, everything that you all have shared today. It's, we could keep going, <laughs> we could keep talking about this. Um, but it's just been uh, moving and thoughtful, and I think your your partnership and your um, and again your passion just really comes through in um, in all of the really insightful things that you've shared with us today. So uh, just huge amount of gratitude from um, from us to you all for joining us and to everybody who joined us on the webinar today. Um, really appreciate you for for sharing all of your good work and thinking and the hard stuff and the fun stuff and the joy and um for everybody who is interested in the next webinar in the series we will be announcing that soon so keep your eyes peeled on linkedin and in uh your inboxes and hopefully see you all soon happy juneteenth